Good evening and welcome to the last of our autumn lectures which have been organized by Green Bank and Morningside Parish Churches. We have been organizing these lectures for 15 years now and it's so good that we're able to work together to learn and explore and to share and enjoy hospitality. Our theme for the lectures this year has been People on the Move, Pilgrimage and Migration. Before we come to the lecture, we begin with a short act of worship. Our reading this evening comes from the Acts of the Apostles, where we see how much those early Christians moved around. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Cos, and then next to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. Through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And when our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, brought us on our way till we were outside the city, and kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and bade one another farewell. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the brethren and stayed with them for one day. On the morrow, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. And he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After these days, we made ready and went up to Jerusalem. It's a bit like the five pilgrim way, except with sunshine on this one here, no doubt. But see how much our foremothers and forefathers traveled as they spread the good news of Jesus Christ in those early days of the Christian church. Let us pray. God of the highway, where you meet with women and men traveling in faith, searching for truth, looking for mercy, and finding a Redeemer. You are known to us not only in the breaking of the bread, but make our hearts burn with love and understanding as we journey with you. And thank you for those others who have accompanied us along the way, those who have pointed us in the right direction, those who have walked beside us, those who have gone ahead, those who will follow after us. Each one of us is a pilgrim seeking the face of God on the road. Help us to rejoice in the journey as much as in the destination with our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds open to each new revelation of your nearness each new revelation of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is a great pleasure almost to, to welcome back one of our own here. Dr. Connor Fagan is the minister at Mark Inch and Thornton Parish Church where he was ordained after his probationary period here and inducted in 2022. Connor grew up in a village in County Down in Northern Ireland. He has a degree in history with a focus on church history and theology, a master's in theology and a PhD in practical theology, all from the University of Aberdeen. Connor began his training for the Ministry of Word and Sacrament in Aberdeen churches, South Nicholas, Cove and Kincorth Church and Ferry Hill Parish Church. He later moved to Edinburgh and served at Richmond Craig Miller and then came here to Morningside to do his probation. And many of you in Greenbank will remember Connor from his time with us when he was involved with the Holy Week services. It's lovely to have you back with us here this evening. I made sure he had his tea at the manse before he came, uh, so he's um, well fueled, um, and just the one glass of wine, I think. Um, and looking forward very much to talk to us tonight about the Fife Pilgrim Way. After his talk, there will be time for questions and answers. But Connor, it's great to have you back with us. Thank you.
Good evening. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. And can I say what a privilege it is to be back here in Morningside with you this evening. It really does feel a little bit like coming home. It wasn't so long that ago that I set out from this church, venturing into deepest, darkest fife to become minister of a church that has been standing there for over 900 years in a location which has reportedly been the site of Christian worship for 1,400 years. I want to start by giving a little bit of an idea of the position that I am in, the place that I come from. Now, if you go to Mark Inch, and I would encourage everyone, we do have uh, tour guides there every day of the week, please do come along. But the current building has undergone extensive redevelopment from the destruction of the post-Reformation years to the expansion of the Victorian, and then, of course, to the maintenance of the modern. It really does not look the same on the inside, but through it all, our Norman Tower has remained resolute. It has been a beacon in this small town, once the capital of Fife, drawing visitors, worshippers, and now, after centuries, of the very notion of pilgrimage being figuratively and possibly quite literally a dirty word in reformed Presbyterian circles, we once again welcome pilgrims, something we are delighted to do. Pilgrims walking the Fife Pilgrim Way, which is the topic of this evening's talk. Hopefully, this evening will be an opportunity to explore the captivating and historically rich topic of the Fife Pilgrim Way, but also to grow to understand it as an opportunity, an opportunity for a modern take on an ancient practice from the perspective of at least one Church of Scotland community, to try and see it not only as a way for the church to engage with the world and the society around it, but also a way of engaging with people People that, despite having less and less time for traditional forms of worship and Christian practice, still find themselves searching, yearning for spiritual fulfillment. For that's what a pilgrimage is. It's not a destination, it is a journey. From ancient times to modern, pilgrimages, whether they're termed as such as not, are a method of people setting out on a journey of self-discovery, of stepping out from the normal and the everyday to undertake a journey of special significance. For whoever takes such a journey, there might be an element of exploration, reflection, or a desire to find something more, to learn something new, to experience something different. And for Christians, and indeed those of many other major faith traditions, this most often includes a conscious seeking of the divine, of a closer, deeper relationship with their God. The Fife Pilgrim Way, along with others, is not simply a path, but it's a bridge to a deeper spiritual experience, to a greater understanding of our landscape, of our urban environment, our historical context, and ultimately, ourselves. I want to start then by offering a brief historical context for what has become the Fife Pilgrim Way. This pilgrim route, which starts at North Queensferry or at Curris Abbey, whichever you want to choose from, in the south of Fife, leads up to the pilgrim city of St. Andrews in the north. It travels through large towns and cities such as Dunfermline, Kirkcaldy, and Glenrothes. It travels through villages such as Ceres, Kelty, Kenaway, and Markinch. It covers the picturesque landscape of this county as well as purposefully, consciously passing through former mining towns and areas that are far from the typical tourist routes. All along the way, it is marked by historical sites of Christian spiritual significance. Though this way, this new way, is not 
a direct replica of the ancient path. Its origins can be traced back to the medieval era, to the Fife Pilgrim Kingdom. I don't know if anyone has heard it called the Pilgrim Kingdom before, but it is a name that Fife acquired due to the genuine transformation of the county that pilgrimage brought to the lives and to the landscape of people in Fife due to the thousands of pilgrims who traveled through, generally obviously stopping at Dunfermline and the burial site of Scotland's kings and queens, especially St. Margaret, and of course then traveling on to St. Andrews and the relics of the apostle. St. Andrews was a category two pilgrimage site, which I always find the ranking quite, if anyone's ever seen Father Ted, there's an episode where they try to change the ranking of a pilgrimage site, and every time I hear that, it makes me laugh. That's what St. Andrews was, category two, which means the only places that were higher up were Rome and the Holy Land. So it really was an important European pilgrimage site. As I have already alluded to, pilgrimage is a practice which transcends cultures. It transcends religions. It involves embarking on a journey, one that will likely end up at a sacred destination before ultimately setting out once again to return to where the pilgrim began. And much like each journey is different, with different challenges and different experiences, the reasons for embarking upon them are equally varied. They encompass religious devotion or a search for the divine, a search for divine intervention even, quite literally a pilgrimage undertaken to grow closer to God. They seek healing, whether physical or spiritual, or of course, pay restitution for some misdeed, some sin. But they're also undertaken due to a desire for personal transformation, whether that's connected to a desire for a religious experience or not, or indeed, if it's a desire to make a change in our lives, maybe make a change in our outlooks, to seek out a challenge, to get healthy, to see the world, or for some to simply go for a walk. There is no hard and fast rule in the modern world for what a pilgrimage is. And in my own experience as a custodian of one of the gateways on this pilgrim route, those that I speak to most regularly can't fully explain why they have undertaken such a journey. For most often, it is the case that all these things come into play. It might be religious, it might be spiritual, it might be that they've been told to get a little bit more exercise. And that is no different from our medieval forebears. The concept of pilgrimage is one, I think, of the most fascinating aspects of medieval European history. For one thing, it offers a cast iron rebuke of the notion that life in the medieval era was small, that it was confined to villages or maybe a few miles around. Pilgrimage was a constant feature of life across this country and many other European countries involving both, both those who were actually on the pilgrimages themselves, but also those who lived in the towns and villages that the pilgrims passed through. They exchanged stories, experiences. They exchanged goods for sale. Pilgrimage was an intrinsic part of the faith, and we can assume the social life for many, many people across Scotland. St. John of the Cross even laments that many set out and make these pilgrimages for recreation rather than devotion. So you can see for hundreds and hundreds of years, it has been the case that there hasn't been one single reason for setting out on a pilgrimage. Indeed, it provided income and gainful employment for countless monasteries, clerics, innkeepers, publicans, shopkeepers, as well as highway robbers, bandits. We shouldn't assume or imagine that pilgrimage was always a walk in the park. The sheer variety of reasons for undertaking a pilgrimage really is breathtaking. For one thing, 
the grueling trip up through Britain to St. Andrews was, for many, as close as they would ever get to a holiday in the south of France. That's just what they did. It's something called religious tourism, and it's something that continues today all across the world. In certain places, whole communities existed simply to service the needs of pilgrims. Indeed, St. Andrews, as a place, grew up around this industry of pilgrimage. If one made the journey to pay respect before the bones of St. Andrew, which were contained in the high altar of the cathedral, you could buy a wonderful array of souvenirs. Beyond the exploits of Celtic monks enduring almost perpetual pilgrimages across Europe and around these islands, we know, of course, that many, if not most, of the general public who also made pilgrimages did so due to their own religious devotion and the genuine belief that visiting sites of particular religious significance would bring spiritual, physical, and mental healing, whether that was for oneself or for a loved one. For others, though, it was a real sense of adventure, of setting out on an unknown path, on dangerous roads, and still others did it under duress. Pilgrimage was an instrument of civic and religious justice, doled out on those who had committed crimes and sins, involuntarily sent on journeys to atone for their misdeeds. So popular was the practice that in the 13th century, the heyday of European pilgrimage, Jack de Vitry, the theologian and chronicler, complained about the hordes of wicked, impious, sacrilegious thieves, robbers, murderers, parasites, perjurers, adulterers, traitors, corsairs, pirates, whoremongers, drunkards, minstrels, jugglers, and actors unleashed on the Holy Land by the courts of Europe. As I said, the medieval reasons for parking, embarking on a pilgrimage were just as varied and frankly a lot more interesting than those of today. The surge in pilgrimage across Scotland in the centuries preceding the Reformation saw a variety of well-trodden paths become pilgrim routes. Bridges were built, roads were maintained, inns were opened, and ecclesiastical buildings were constructed. And among the most prominent of these was the Fife Pilgrim Routes. Tom Turpey of Stirling University says, the economy, the communication networks, the landscape, and the religious and cultural life of Fife, perhaps more than any other region of medieval Scotland, was shaped by the presence of pilgrims and the veneration of saints. Something that the modern pilgrim way hopes in some way to replicate. Nevertheless, all good things must come to an end. The Reformation, for the most part, brought an end to these practices here in Scotland, and pilgrimage declined all across Europe, and for the most part, it disappeared here. But something remarkable has happened over the last three or four decades. Pilgrimage is back, and it's back with a bang. In 1986, 1,801 pilgrims walked the famous and ancient Spanish Camino, often known just as the way, which culminates at the Cathedral Church of Santiago de Compostela, the reputed burial place of St. James the Great, one of the disciples, as you no doubt will have heard all about from Dr. Fraser a few weeks ago. That was 1,801. In 2018, there were 300 and 27,378. 327,378. That's the change. This, you have to call it a phenomenon, has also hit Scotland, which has seen nine pilgrim ways open, and three more are in preparation. They are in the early stages of creating them. And in 2017, the Church of Scotland's General Assembly broke 
silence, uh, broke, broke with silence of over 400 years to commend pilgrimage to the contemporary church, which since the Reformation had dismissed it as yet another example of the distortions that the church had gotten itself into, that do-it-yourself salvation, clocking up points by undertaking a grueling journey to pray before the relics of a saint. At that assembly, a deliverance was passed to affirm the place of pilgrimage in the life of the church and to encourage congregations to explore opportunities for pilgrimage locally and how to provide hospitality and practical and spiritual support for pilgrims passing through the various parishes. And two years later, at Dunfermline Abbey, with all due acclaim, the modern Fife Pilgrim Way was launched. A route that was designed by the Fife Coast and Countryside Trust, also responsible for the Fife uh, coastal path, if anyone has walked that, for the Lomond Hills Park and a variety of different recreation and conservation sites across Fife. But what's most interesting, from my perspective anyway, about the creation of the Pilgrim Way in Fife is that it combined not only a desire to encourage tourism and exploration of the countryside, but that this secular body works in lockstep with representatives from Christian churches, ensuring that it is the churches that have become the gateways or way markers along the routes rather than simply using towns and villages. We see this project with huge amounts of potential. We see the opportunity for engagement between the church and Civic Scotland in a new and an interesting way that brings distinct benefits to both. The Pilgrim, Fife Pilgrim Way is only one of many Scottish pilgrim routes. There are currently seven that are fully waymarked, so they have signs all along them that you can follow. There are others that are planning to do this and that are waymarking parts of it. All across the country, Local groups and churches are taking advantage of this renaissance in Scottish pilgrimage, using this ancient idea as a means of engaging with the modern world, using these routes, so long traveled by our forebears, as a way of encouraging people to get out and to see the country around them, something that the COVID pandemic has certainly helped with. In essence, it is hoped that the Fife Pilgrim Way showcases that rich cultural heritage of Fife. Now, briefly, to give you an idea of the route, it must first be said that the Fife Pilgrim Way isn't the, necessarily the authentic old Pilgrim Way. It's just a version of one of them, because there were so many different ways to get to St. Andrews, as I'm sure anyone who's ever driven there will know. It depended on where you started or where you landed on the Fife coast. The routes all across the county crisscrossed, joining forces here, veering off there. There was no one route or way. Therefore, those who were tasked with creating the new one, the modern one, essentially had carte blanche to create something that worked for them. The route that has emerged then has sought to take those traveling the way not only through the tourist hotspots of the East Nuke, but instead force, I shouldn't have said force, encourage people to go through the other areas of Fife that you wouldn't necessarily go, the places that aren't on everyone's list of holiday destinations. These include inland towns, former mining communities, and the newer settlements such as Glenrothes. Through this way of creating a new pilgrim path. The Fife Pilgrim Way is, is replicating an ancient theme. It's taking travelers away from their daily life or their typical journeys and bringing them into new experiences, different places, places that most of us would simply pass by. For those who are walkers among us, the Pilgrim Way is a relatively simple walk using existing rights of way through 
at, though at 64 miles, it isn't something that you can do in a day. For many, it's done over the course of many, many weeks. Indeed, there are eight gateways or resting points in areas of interest, namely Curras, North Queensferry, Dunfermline, Lahore Meadows, King Lassie, Mark Inch, Ceres, and Kennaway, allowing the route to be easily broken up. It was designed to be walked in parts. And in some cases, my own in particular, it has meant a huge change to the local church. If due time and energy is invested to take advantage of the opportunity that the Fife Pilgrim Way can present, or indeed any of the new Pilgrim Ways. Just to give you an example of our church, at the halfway point, the town and the parish of Mark Inch has taken particular advantage of the Pilgrim Way. As a church, we have seen it as a tool to reach out and to draw in. We have seen thousands of visitors over the last four years, pilgrims, tourists, and even some locals who had never been through the doors. The man who fixed my car thought the place had been closed, which was an interesting conversation for someone who had just arrived in the parish, but there you go. We have seen huge numbers of people coming through the doors of our church, a church that has stood there for so long, but it started to drift from the society that it was part of. We have gone from being a church on the hill, distant from the community, to being one at its heart, with a steering group running our day-to-day -day activities made up of representatives from the church, of course, but also from the local heritage group and the community council. We have over 30 volunteers who act as our tour guides and ensure that the building is open seven days a week seven months of the year, and around a third of those come from the community who had previously no connection with the church. In an age when the Church of Scotland in particular is searching for ways to engage with the society around it, we have grasped this as one way to do just that. It has changed drastically the life of our church community. It has seen Many of our members get much more involved. It has seen friendships arise, social events be organized, and it's given the wider community a greater sense of ownership over a building which we, of course, cherish as our parish church, but it isn't one we can justify as a one-day-a-week enterprise. The Fife Pilgrim Way, maintained by a secular organization with its main concern being the physical well-being of people around tourism, the promotion of the Fife countryside, this organization has contributed significantly to what the Church of Scotland obsessively calls mission in our parish. And we have become uh, an example for other churches in our presbytery. The Fife Pilgrim way has made great efforts to make the route safe and navigable for the widest possible range of people and abilities through the help of local organizations, the council, the Five Coast and Countryside Trust. They have restored ancient rights of way. They have made signs, they've cut grass, and they've even had some help from the locals. One of my own elders claims to have done a little bit of vigilante topiary, taking some secateurs to a particularly bother bothersome bush under the cover of darkness. He assures me it's fine, he just didn't want to do the paperwork, but there you go. I'll leave that up to whoever decides these things. Clear way marking, accessible information, maps, and well-marked resting points ensure that this route is made an, an attractive proposition for those contemplating the journey. But I suppose the great question remains, why? Why does an, an otherwise sensible person decide to set out to walk through deepest, darkest Fife, enduring the cold and the rain and the wet and the wet? Well, if there are any Fifers here tonight, the answer is obvious. 
It's the only place in the world worth being. But <laughs> for the rest of us, why do people use this route? What is it that draws the modern person out of their cozy homes to endure a walk like this with all the uncertainties that it can present? As I've said, some embark on this route simply as that, as a route, a path to walk along for exercise for nothing other than a way to get our step counts up. But this is not the only reason, and I would venture to say that it is very much in the minority of reasons. The reasons why people set out on modern-day pilgrimages are as varied and variable as those of our medieval forerunners. People still set out on such journeys for a search for a deeper spirituality and for mental, physical, and psychological healing, oftentimes mixed with that sense of adventure or a desire to break free from the humdrum of everyday life and to broaden our horizons. Very much like those who up sticks and move to the countryside, having lived for years in the city for a different kind of life. Spiritual pilgrimages are still undertaken, whether they are termed as such or not. The sentiment remains. The desired outcome may be slightly different. For instance, most modern-day pilgrims in Scotland may not describe their journeys as one seeking the transitory properties of physical proximity to the bones of a saint or the site of a particular religious or spiritual significance. But the desire for change remains for many. There remains a real desire to attempt to reorient our lives away from self-centeredness, to try and to start again, using a long journey sometimes as a break with the past, trying to start over to create a shift in one's life. Similarly, in a world of convenience for so many people, a nudging curiosity for a simpler, more straightforward life, if only for a short time, is attractive to some people. We once had a chap who came quite literally with the bag on his back and the sandals on his feet with nowhere to stay, nothing to eat. And having literally sung for his supper in the local hostelry, was given a bed for the night before setting out on his way the following morning. Who says hospitality is dead? And this is another factor of pilgrimage. The desire, the need for company. For many, it is as St. John of the Cross complained. It's a recreational, social endeavor, one that brings people together in a different, in a new way. The newly appointed pilgrim pastor in Fife regularly leads groups from all over the country along the path, stopping in at various churches along the way. The volunteers in my church have repeatedly cited the chance to meet new people as a core reason for them giving up so much of their time. It's little wonder, really, when you think about what we have gone through over these past years of isolation and that trend in our society towards more insular lives. Beyond this, there is also a distinct rediscovery of the importance of place, of landscape, of the natural environment, of our connection to these things, as well as the widespread interest in history and local history in particular, which has seen heritage groups spring up all over the country. And this relatively new phenomenon, as the Church of Scotland begins to dispose of a great number of A-listed and historical church buildings, of local parties coming together to set up trusts to run them. And none of that is to mention the growing awareness and importance placed on those obvious benefits to physical and mental well-being that exercise, fresh air, and company can provide. And of course, there is the conscious and unconscious spiritual or religious aspect to such an undertaking that cannot be ignored. Pilgrimage 
as a concept is deeply rooted in religious understanding, whether that is Christian or indeed one of the other major faiths, almost all of whom have a tradition of pilgrimage. For pilgrims of the past and the present, the journey offers an opportunity, an opportunity for self-reflection, for spiritual growth and a connection to the divine. The rhythm of walking, the serenity of nature, and the encounters with fellow travelers create an atmosphere that really is conducive to introspection. It creates an atmosphere that allows one to transcend the experience of the everyday, to move beyond that which is necessary, to encounter something other. It is well known that organized and traditional religious practices have been on the decline for the last half century or more. Fewer people find purpose or meaning in the practices that many of us within the Church of Scotland hold very dear to our hearts. But that doesn't mean that faith or that spirituality has suffered the same fate. Instead, many find spiritual fulfillment, connections, and relationships with the divine in different ways, one of which is undoubtedly pilgrimage, in practical, physical ways of seeking out God's presence. I would venture that if asked, most people would not say that they find God is closest to them within a church building. Instead, they might say the seaside or the top of a mountain or something like that. What might be termed as traditional forms of worship do not work for a lot of people. They may never have, but there was less choice. Traditional ways of speaking about faith do not work for a lot of people. And again, they may never have. And that's partially why churches like the Kirk are in the state that they are. But still, so many people want to explore faith and spirituality, and pilgrimage is one way of doing this. Others might be through art or music or even walking prayer labyrinths which spring up from time to time. For many, it is easier. It's more fulfilling to walk rather than talk, to express their faith in physical ways rather than through discussion groups or Bible studies. Many find it encouraging to walk in the footsteps of their forebears, to retrace ancient paths, knowing that they walk with them in the company of all who went before, something that Christianity terms the communion of saints. Professor Ian Bradley convincingly argues that far more Christians now describe their faith as an ongoing journey rather than a sudden decisive conversion experience. The road to Emmaus, where along with the resurrected Jesus, traveled with two disciples, two of his disciples, for many, many miles before they recognized him. This seems to resonate with more believers nowadays than the road to, to Damascus, where St. Paul underwent a sudden blinding conversion. Pilgrimage, movement, traveling resonates with how many of us experience our faith. In a world of uncertainties and competing truths, the option to journey, to stop, to go back a few steps before going on again, searching, exploring, investigating what faith is, what it means, who God is, where God is to be found, is often more compelling and more fulfilling. It is a more accessible method of spiritual engagement than the often passive experience of a Sunday service. This less prescriptive, more active method of religious engagement chimes too with a growing trend within the Christian church of recognizing the need, not simply to be a church with rigid answers, but one which offers an invitation to explore the questions in the first place. Pilgrimage is an opportunity for the Christian church. It is an opportunity to welcome and explore, to reach out and meet new people, to share new experiences, find new interests, and in many ways, 
spread the mission and the message of Jesus. There are, of course, numerous modern pilgrims whose primary compulsion to set out on these journeys is wanderlust, a sense of adventure or historical interest, just as was the case for our medieval ancestors. Nevertheless, it is important to be careful about making hard and fast distinctions between these categories. The line has always been blurred between tourists and pilgrims. Undertaking a pilgrimage such as the Fife Pilgrim Way or any of the others, whether one terms it as a pilgrimage or not, is so often a search for something beyond a holiday, a search for something deeper, something more meaningful, whether that is explicitly religious or indeed more in line with the kind of personal development most people crave. And this is precisely where the opportunity for the church arises. If the Christian church truly believes it has a mission and a message that is worth sharing with the world, pilgrimage is one of the greatest opportunities to do so today. For in it, the churches who do engage have the chance to transform tourists into pilgrims. It's something that we take seriously in my parish through hospitality, through offering a chance for prayer and reflection, through special weekly pilgrim services. If only for the 15 minutes or the hour that they spend with us, they become pilgrims. They are welcomed into our church. They are shown our values and, and, and our message, even if they aren't preached at, so to speak. Our focus isn't filling our pews, however nice that would be. It can't be, as these people are on the move. They're just traveling through. Instead, it's a conscious decision to try to spread the message that we have, that we believe is important to spread, and hope that it will bear fruit sometime, somewhere. Over the last three or four decades, a remarkable change has taken place within churches, such as the Church of Scotland. Once the gatekeepers of religious and spiritual norms in this country, who for centuries dismissed the idea of pilgrimage as arcane, superstitious, unnecessary, a change has taken place in how we understand faith, spirituality, and human need, as well as human experience. Churches here and all across Europe who have rejected this practice for so long have begun to see its benefits, have begun to engage with it in so many different ways. We have awoken to the simple fact that pilgrimage in that liminal, transitory state offers an opportunity. It offers an opportunity to come closer to the divine. It offers an opportunity for change. It offers the traditional parish churches a new method of engaging with the world, and it offers members, hitherto passive participants in their faith, a chance to become just a little bit more active, to explore, to connect with their own history, with new people, to deepen both their personal relationships and that with their faith. Pilgrimage truly is an opportunity, one for which those who embark on it or participate in in some way can return in some small way changed, healed, refreshed, enriched, with their horizons broadened. It gives people the chance to leave their settled routines for a while, to walk in the footsteps of the faithful of countless ages and find new companions on the way. It offers the Christian church a new outlook on what its mission actually is in the world. As we come close to the end, you'll be pleased to hear, come close to the end of this exploration of the Fife Pilgrim Way, we find ourselves at this moment in 2023 standing at the crossroads of history, of spirituality, of culture. This 
ancient root not, on, root not only connects us to the past, but it also offers space. It encourages a space for personal reflection, for cultural enrichment, and a deeper understanding of the human journey that we are all on. This evening has been a very brief look at what I believe is incredibly exciting development within the church, but hopefully it has also sparked an interest, an interest in some to explore the opportunities that things like this present, both as a pastime and as a way of engaging with faith, with spirituality. A way of engaging with the God who meets us, not only in fixed places and in fixed times, but always and everywhere, and often on the road. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Connor. I wonder if anyone's got any questions. If you just want to raise a hand, I can move amongst you with the microphone. What for you, uh, presumably you've walked the Pilgrim Way. I've walked parts of the Pilgrim Way. Parts of the I haven't made the whole thing yet, uh, as you what, can see. Yeah, what are some of the, the highlights that you found for you, some of the places that you visited that were surprising um, on that particular route? I would have to say, and I never thought I would say this, but I have walked part of it which goes through Glenrothes. So, as I said, one of the things that they were really keen to do was to make the pilgrim route go through places that people don't usually go to, to use it as a way of invigorating the economy in, in Fife and to try and encourage people to see different places in different parts. And I found that we walked a, a, a part of it between the churches in, uh, in our local area. And I found it amazing to walk between my ancient parish and this almost brand new one, and to see the links that we were trying to develop, that we are still trying to develop. And they're all joined up with these just paths that bypass roads that don't, you don't meet lots of people, but they're there, they're always there. These little lines that are linking us, that are tying us together, and I found that that for me anyway, it was possibly the most impressive part of it. I mean, the, there is lots of wonderful scenery and places to go to, but in terms of the meaning behind it, I found that that was really quite important for me to see that you know, whatever we're doing, the world is still connecting us together. You know, we might decide that it's difficult to join up two churches, but apparently the world has a, a different idea of what's going on. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Was there a problem between the um, religious side of organizing this and the um, civil side of it? Uh, did councils all cooperate? Uh, no and yes. There, was, there actually was no, uh, there were no problems. From the very beginning, the Fife Coast and Countryside Trust engaged with the councils and with the churches. They asked for representatives from the Christian churches to be part of creating it. They used the experience of historians, especially people from St. Andrews, from the University of St. Andrews were involved in trying to come up with something that would work. That they, I think they always knew it wouldn't be exactly an ancient route and it would pass through different ways, but they used the experience from uh, you know, the divinity department, and the history department to create that. But even now, we, I said during it, we have a steering group which runs our church, and I think of all of the, the waymarked churches, on uh, the gateway churches, ours is probably the one that has invested most in it, and it's been the thing that we've really tried to focus in on, because, just because of the interests within our parish. But our uh, steering group, which has community council uh, and the, uh, the local heritage group, is also attended by the Fife Coast and Countryside Trust. They're still engaging with the churches. They're still trying to come in. But it, it really has been amazing to see what you can do when 
it isn't always that easy within the church to see where we can fit into this world that doesn't seem to want us. But in certain areas, they really have been just crying out for people to engage with them. So uh, it, it, it hasn't been a problem at all, which is very odd to say. This is more a, more a comment than a question, really, Connor. Good. My wife and I have done a fair bit of walking in France and did a, a significant chunk of the Santiago de Compostela route all the way to the Spanish border. Um, and we, on a separate walk, fell in in the middle of France, in the Beaujolais, with a family, where the, the man in the house had done the pilgrimage. And we asked him, where did you start from? And of course, he said, from here. <laughs> now, it's, that, was, that was a key part in my head of what pilgrimage was about. And I just wonder if the way things are going now, the kind of sanitizing almost the accessibility of these pilgrim routes takes away an essential bit of what they were. I think, to reply to your comment, <laughs> I, I, I think that one, for a lot of people, we have a guy who is not a part of the church but uh, is heavily involved in our, uh, uh, our open church project and our pilgrimage project. Um, he is very much of the opinion that his pilgrim he goes on pilgrimages constantly, uh, and they start from the door. I mean, quite literally, he walked from here and did the, the, the Camino um, a number of years ago. Uh, for other people, that's just not possible in this day and age. And I think the idea is, obviously, it started with tourism and health benefits and all the rest of it, but even from a religious or a, a Christian perspective, it's better to do something than nothing. That's the way I look at it. Um, and we're, th there's some work going on at the moment too because if you're trying to be accessible, a lot of people can't do any of a pilgrim way. So th it, it's ways of creating pilgrimages from home, you know, th different ways of looking at what you can do to engage with this kind of spiritual practice that is important. So yes, I think it, it, it is of course sanitized. It has changed. I mean, everything ends up that way, but I think it's still better than, than nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that in, in, in we talk about pilgrimages and think you have to travel great miles to do it. If you think particularly of our sisters and brothers in the Roman Catholic Church, in Holy Week they do the ways of the cross, the stations of the cross, and all they do is to simply walk round um, bits in the church. That's another form of pilgrimage. It doesn't have to be 64 miles through, through darkest five. Um, challenging and lovely though that is. Other questions? I was interested in your comment about the waymarking uh, and the uh, mix of interests that contributed to that. Can you tell us just what this, the visual nature of the waymarking is? A lot of people who are familiar with the Compostela route know immediately when they see the sign. Mm -hmm. And it's a reference for other people who are not on the pilgrimage, but they recognize what that means. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's distinctive in the Fife context. So there are a number of things, which is often a problem to start with, but there are a few different things that they have chosen. So there is a Fife Pilgrim badge, which I should have worn this evening, but I didn't, uh, didn't want to ruin my suit. It does poke in. Uh, but it is a badge that has taken different symbols from across the different churches in Fife, uh, starting off with uh, uh, there is a cross, there's a, an image of St. Andrew, um, there's the cross from my church, actually, which is unique, and that's the only place that it, that shape of cross has been discovered. So there is that as a symbol, mostly for people who are engaged in creating it and, and staffing the pilgrim way, but the way marking is a purple sign. So they are all over Fife. Everywhere you go in Fife near this pilgrim route, there are little uh, stands with purple signs. And then at each of the gateway churches, um, the eight gateway churches, we have these uh, sort of, they look like manhole covers, but they're actually bronze plates that have been placed in the ground. So they are supposed to mark the, the, that particular gateway, as I say, that those are at churches. And then they have signs, these beautiful ornate signs in each of the, the gateway areas, so Dunfermline and uh, K 
Kennaway and places like that with more information maps and, and ways of directing you on. But the thing you will see most often is these little poles, I don't know what these stakes, I suppose, uh, and they have purple uh, arrows on them, and they point you in the direction of, of the Pilgrim Way. And that's, that's the sort of practical way that, that, that they do it. Um, Another question? Yep. Where do the pilgrims stay when they stop for the night? Are there hostels where they can gather, or do they stay in church halls? The, this is one of the, the, I keep saying exciting developments. It is an exciting development. Um, in England, there has been, over the past few years, a growth in something called champing. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but literally camping in churches. It hasn't yet taken off in Scotland, but there are a number, in particular, uh, series church um, are, are seriously looking at things like that. At the moment, we have a list of places you can go to. So in our town, there's you know camping sites and uh, hotels and what have you. But some of the churches along the way are looking at possibly turning either the church or their church halls into places that can, people could literally bunk for the night. You know, th there are no other facilities, but it is a warm and a dry space for them. Um, one of the big issues beyond the even sleeping has been the availability of services. I mean, there are apparently very few seats along the way. That's something that different places are, are, are trying to address. Putting in benches and places you could sit and have some lunch. You know, there are practical things like that, but it's still in its infancy, which means that people are really trying to figure out the kinks in it. And it's not Spain. You know, the heat isn't the same, the weather isn't the same, so there, there are complications with that. So there is a real move at the moment to see if there is a way that we could use buildings that are being closed or underused as places for people to stay. Um, but camping seems to be a big one at the moment. Time for one more question. Which is the minister's way of saying no more questions. If there's nobody else who wants to ask another question, can I say, Conrad, thank you so much. Apart from it being lovely having you back with us here again, um, it's been great to hear about something that's, that's relatively on um, our doorsteps. One thing I did want to ask, you mentioned that there are other pilgrim ways. I know the, the St. Cuthbert way. I think um, there's a St. Ninian's way, I think, in the uh, southwest. St. Kentigan, there's the, the Three Saints way, which is going to link, which is currently under development. It's one of the non-fully uh, waymarked ones, which is really quite interesting, but it's uh, from Iona to St. Andrews, which is the Three Saints way, and they're hopefully going to turn that into a really big uh, thing for Scotland once it's fully developed. But, um, there are other places that uh, literally local churches are creating their own, but I do have a list. There's St. Magnus and Cuthbert Borders Abbey's Way. Uh, there's the Deeside Way in Aberdeen. There's the Fourth to Farn Way, which is uh, Berwick to Lindisfarne. Um, St. Kentigan, yes, I've already had that. Fife, I think that was there. Yeah. Okay. There are their plants. <laughs> so lots for us to let get walking, but maybe in the summer months <laughs> when it's, it's nice. Thank you so much for an informative thing that told us something not just about where it is in, in Fife, but also some of the points that tie into pilgrimage. It's not about the destination. It's so often about the journey. And your talk tonight has taken us along that particular journey uh, as we've had an opportunity to think about what that means in a place that's literally about 40, 40 minutes away from here. If anyone would like to do um, the Fife Way at some point, I'm sure Connor would be happy to pass on information um, in, the, in the not too distant future. But for this evening, thank you so very much for all that you brought to us tonight. We've come to the end of our autumn lecture season. Thank you all for attending tonight. It's been lovely to see so many of you here. You're invited to support the evening and lecture series by making a donation as you leave the church this evening. 
once again. And it's really important to say that it's not just the people that we see up front who've contributed to these lectures. So many people in the background have provided the artwork for the posters, uh, they provided the, the sound system and the, the live link, they provided for the hospitality and the opening of the church. So to anyone who's played in any part um, in this season from Green Bank and from Morningside, thank you so very much for your contribution over these last few weeks. It's been good that we have been able to work and to walk together over these last few weeks. So thank you all very much for your attendance, your support, and your participation. We close with prayer. Let us pray. God's blessing be yours, and well may it befall you. Christ's blessing be yours, and well may you be treated. The Spirit's blessing be yours, and well may you spend your lives each day that you rise up each night that you lie down. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, revealed to us as Father and as Son and as Holy Spirit, be with you all this night and forevermore. Amen.